We'll continue these briefings every other week through at least the month of May. Uh, today, we're joined by Provost Susan Collins, Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon, Chief Health Officer, Preeti Milani, Rob Ernst, Chair of our Campus Health Response Committee, and Dana Habers, uh, who's the Chief Department Administrator in Radiology, but has been serving as the co-lead of Michigan Medicine's COVID-19 Vaccination and Therapeutics Task Force. Let me first turn it over to Dr. Milani for an update on campus conditions. Preeti? Yeah, thank you. You know, these town halls have provided a, a sort of cadence to my life, and I look forward to them because I, first of all, I get to see my colleagues chat a little bit before we, we open up. But, you know, in large part, because really it means we're two weeks closer to the end of this nightmare. And a few town halls ago, I expressed a lot of optimism about where we were headed. And I, I actually, I remain very optimistic for really intermediate and long term. But the situation today in Michigan, as everyone knows, is it's not good. And in a matter of just a few weeks, Michigan's gone from having some of the lowest COVID-19 infection rates to having the highest rates in the country. And the rate of increase is what is alarming. And Emily Martin, who often joins us, talks about that, that slope. And if you look at the curves, it's really concerning. And Governor Whitmer had a press conference today and shared a few things. Uh, the number of cases is four times higher than in mid-February, which is really alarming. The case positivity rate for tests is 18%. That's the highest since uh, last spring. And the uh, inpatient hospitalization rate is 15.2% across the, the, the state. And hospitals are beginning to implement surge plans. So you know, this, is, uh, this isn't good news. And unlike prior waves, there have been large cases in younger adults, teens, and even children. And you know, it's hard to generalize, but we at Michigan Medicine are also seeing younger patients with severe illness. And from my perspective, one of the things that I really feel badly about is that these are people who have managed to stay safe for an entire year only to become infected in often in very low risk gatherings uh, at a time when we have uh, vaccination becoming available to everyone. And cases are higher everywhere, but there's certain communities that are more impacted and the B117 variant is widespread. And Again, it's, it's not one thing, it never is, but we are hearing large groups of people are getting together without masks and might have 50 or 60 people get infected because someone's there with minimal symptoms and youth sports have been implicated and school reopenings, but not because of the classroom or competition, but because of the social activity that everyone is longing to do. And you know, college campuses are a reflection of the broader community. And my, my good friend, Rob Ernst is gonna talk a bit about this. And, you know, back in January, we saw a climb in infections and there was a stay at home recommendation and things got better and, you know, they're, they're back up again. And I would just say the risk remains high and that there's less margin for error. I also would add that, you know, the situation in Michigan, a lot of people are asking, well, why is Michigan like this? And I, I don't think, again, I, I don't think Michigan is unique. I, I think that we're probably ahead of the curve. Uh, sadly, that we're going to see more outbreaks like this in, in, um, in some other states. Uh, the good news is, is we have, in addition to masks in public and keeping away from crowds and things, is we have vaccines. And we're going to talk about that with Dana. And uh, that is really good news. Uh, I just want to say that, which is something I've said multiple times, is vaccination isn't just that it protects you. Personally, it protects everyone around you. And clearly, vaccination is what's going to get us to the next phase. And although it's happening, uh, the numbers in our state are still not at a herd immunity level. And we have about 58% of people 65 and above and about 25% of all adults are fully vaccinated. That means 75% are not vaccinated. So, you know, it's understandable a year into the pandemic that people are longing for a sense of normalcy. I know I am. And, um, you know, some people have kind of moved on and given up on public health guidance, but I would just ask people, please, like let's make plans to get vaccinated, try to hang on, Try to at least keep your gathering small. Keep wearing the mask in public. Uh, thanks, Preeti. You want to bring uh, Rob on to answer some yeah, questions? Yeah, I'd love to bring Rob on. I know Rob is there. <clears throat> you know, Rob, before we get into the questions, I just, I, you know, you're thinking about this every day and deep into the numbers. Uh, any other thoughts about what's happening on campus? 
Well, I, uh, as usual, really agree with you. You know, we've uh, seen the same factors that are a risk for transmission. You've got mixing and movement. And when groups come together, particularly if there's travel involved, that that uh, offers the opportunity for spread and uh, the emergence of the variant strains that we think are more transmissible really does provide lower margin for error. So that's where we're seeing you know, spread when the uh, guard goes down. Um, I share your enthusiasm for vaccination and I really, really love your construct for saying vaccination protects individuals, but it also protects communities. And I think that's gonna factor into you know, some of our strategies as we try and stay nimble in our recommendations to either you know, ramp up if we need to, ramp down if we're able to. Yeah, and I know we're gonna talk about vaccination and really some of the wonderful plans that you and others have lobbied so hard to make happen. And I know the president and everyone, we're gonna be doing some great vaccinations next week on campus. But uh, I know that this is, this is hard because everyone wants to be vaccinated now. And you know, there was the same thing happening to healthcare workers back in January. I actually, despite being an infectious disease physician on the front line, I actually had to wait a couple of weeks to get my uh, vaccine. And you know, I did feel a little bad watching everyone else get vaccinated. But again, remember, uh, this is gonna happen. It's gonna happen soon. Uh, slots are opening up on campus and then also in the surrounding area. But you know, the, what I, I'm actually happy to hear that people are going to Ford Field. I recognize not everyone can get there, but the more that get vaccinated and the sooner it happens, it helps protect all of us. So speaking of that, um, Rob, with increasing numbers of vaccinated people in our community, what are you thinking about in terms of changing guidelines around travel, face coverings, testing, and other public health measures? Yeah, and I, I, I believe that with vaccination, we have a, an avenue out of uh, some of these uh, mitigation strategies in time. And I look forward to the time when we can come together, you know, and have a sort of post COVID campus that feels, you know, uh, more natural. I, uh, I know that we're, we're now getting some good guidance from CDC on how to sort of take an incremental approach to this, you know, I think around travel, for instance, you know, there's really good wisdom as the science evolves about not needing to, you know, quarantine after travel, if you're fully vaccinated and we've uh, adopted that strategy. Um, I think, uh, the, the face covering situation, I think, is still guidance for smaller groups where you can assure that everybody in the group is fully vaccinated. I think that's going to be you know, trickier for big populations or, or places where, you know, uh, greater numbers of people are coming together. But th that time will come. Uh, the issue with testing is something that I do see uh, a, a more near term opportunity to scale back our requirements for surveillance of uh, subclinical illness and people who are fully vaccinated. That science is coming along to where it's really encouraging what we're seeing about the efficacy of these uh, uh, vaccines for prevention of infection, even low level infection. So I, I see that as probably one of the, the next things that we're able to do once we're able to get our arms around um, access and uh, our ability to keep track. Yeah, I agree with you. And it's been really nice to get that really granular guidance from the CDC and it's been coming, you know, it feels like it's slow, but it's actually, we've gotten a lot of guidance as vaccinations have rolled out. And speaking of vaccinations, will you even be asking students who have received the vaccine at an alternate site to report or prove that they've had the vaccine? And I know you're really thinking about what this might look like for the fall too. Right. Yeah. And it was, uh, you know, we, we do expect to have an opportunity for students to self-disclose their vaccine status to us. And we're going to be encouraging students to do so, particularly as we're able to link that to expectations and opportunities to exempt out of certain mandates. So um, not ready to announce yet, but I expect really soon that we're going to have that system up in place and, you know, um, really great, great work by a number of folks here at the university, particularly uh, in our uh, testing compliance subgroup, as well as our uh, information technology colleagues to try and make these systems talk to one another. So it, we will have the ability to, um, we believe, cross-reference our testing mandate population, for instance, against students and their vaccine history if they choose to self-disclose that information. We hope that they will. Similarly, for our um, quarantine and isolation uh, database, you know, as individuals are identified as close contacts, you know, we have guidance that suggests that, you know, if they're asymptomatic and a close contact and fully vaccinated, then they don't need to quarantine. So having that information will be really helpful. 
Yeah, you know, before the pandemic, which feels like a lifetime ago, we, you and I were trying to figure some of this stuff out, really you and thinking about how the systems talk to each other. And, you know, there are some silver linings to this. And I think the just the great, great work that Jim Beam and, you know, Ravi and others have done on the IT side is just, I, I think we don't always see it, but, uh, but I just want to say thank you to them. Uh, what strategies will the university implement in the final weeks of the winter semester to reduce large gatherings and out of town visitors? Yeah, well, I know that there's been uh, interest in uh, arranging some structured um, uh, events that can be engineered for social distancing and sort of monitored for masking. And, um, you know, we've had some of these opportunities for students around the exciting, you know, men's and women's basketball events recently. And we found that, you know, a structured event like that, that can really build in these um, strategies are, are not associated with transmission and probably much safer than unstructured gatherings that may be for the same event. So um, the, the teams that are planning this are working with the, uh, um, with the public health folks to, you know, do these events safely. So I'm confident about that. Yeah, we've got lots of big outdoor spaces, fortunately, and I know the tents have gone up too. So, okay, yeah, thanks, Rob. I'm going to turn it back over to the president. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Rob and Preeti. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Dana Habers, who will discuss vaccination opportunities for students and for the rest of the campus. Uh, Dana, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. I have very exciting news today, actually. So, we know that. Thousands of our U of M employees across all three campuses have been able to get their vaccine, but we know that it's not been easy or convenient to navigate some of those systems to find them. Uh, we've had a lot of really heavy lifting work in the last few weeks. Um, as you probably have heard, on April 5th, the state of Michigan opened eligibility in their prioritization schema to all adults age 16 and up. So that really brings forward an opportunity for our students to be included in the vaccine efforts. Uh, we have lined up again, thanks to Rob and Jason Shellhouse and many others across campus to for, for their partnership in this, this effort, several clinics in the coming uh, days. And I just wanted to run through those briefly, although uh, uh, the best resource for you to go to to find detailed information is your campus maze and blue website. So those are real time updates on opportunities that we've been able to bring vaccine closer to all three campuses. Um, and back to kind of Preeti's point, I think our goal is, of course, herd immunity and what that looks like with the new COVID uh, strains and with our current situation in the state is our, our, we feel like we're in sort of a race between vaccination and uh, COVID again. So just encourage you to ask questions and uh, reach out if you're not sure how to, how to get vaccinated or whether to get vaccinated. Um, starting on Tuesday this coming week, so Tuesday and Wednesday, April 13th and 14th, in partnership uh, with Kroger, and actually this is a really great demonstration of how we've responded to this as a entity, part of a public health crisis. This is not a Michigan medicine oriented project. This is really stepping into a space across the state to try to help serve the population of Michigan and get to that 70 plus percent vaccination rate. Uh, we have some doses from Kroger that'll be administered at the Michigan Athletics Indoor Training Facility. Uh, there's a registration form on the campus maize and blue website. There are clinics planned for uh, Thursday and Friday, April 15th and 16th at Meyer on Celine Road. They're hosting a special U of M students only vaccination campaign. And so several appointment slots there. You just text go blue, all one word to 75049 to start your registration process for that site. On Saturday through Tuesday, April 17th through the 20th at our beloved Michigan Stadium on the first floor, we're so excited to expand. We've been operating on the third and fourth floor, as you know, towards uh, our patient populations and eligible individuals over 50 years old so far in that early phase 1A healthcare and frontline essential worker workforce on the third and fourth floor. Now on the first floor, we'll be offering vaccines for students um, in the coming days. So if you have completed your Blue Q questionnaire, you are already registered for that and you don't really have to do anything at all. We're going to send invitations out in waves 
Uh, we don't have enough doses to get to everybody still. We're still in a state of uh, trying to get enough supply to reach everybody who wants to be vaccinated. But we will get to you and we'll, we'll continue to host additional dates as soon as we, we get vaccine supply. For our students in Flint, uh, we are bringing the vaccine to Flint. So we have on Thursday and Friday, April 14th and 15th, plans to bring vaccinators and vaccine over to the North Bank Center building. Again, if you've already completed your Blue Q questionnaire, you don't need to register, you're already on our list and we'll send invitations out and waves to you. Um, so please just keep an eye on your portal. Uh, in Dearborn on Friday, April 16th at the Fairlane Center North, uh, we'll also have vaccine appointments available there. And these are all single dose. So it's a really convenient option. This is the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And that's a really important thing when you're planning your kind of end of semester, the transition to this next chapter in, in summer. Um, we know that after you get your vaccine, it takes a couple of weeks for you to be to fully recognize the benefits and the protection of the vaccine. So if you think about getting vaccine or vaccinated this week, uh, by the time you wrap up your finals and head home to your families, you'll have that full protection. So just really encourage you to check out the website and stay plugged in so you can get uh, information on, on where to go. So really excited to offer that. Um, Backing up just a, a step, I think the other thing I wanted to share was just about, um, I, you know, I know that a lot of people are still very concerned and hesitant, and there's a lot of uh, fear about vaccination. And, and we've done a lot of work to try to listen to those concerns and make the process such that you, you can um, ask those questions. I think it's a really important part in our community that we influence one another and having that space to talk about what's bothering you or what your concerns look like, um, encourage you to have that dialogue and talk to one another about it. Um, I think this is a really important part of us just protecting one another and making sure that we uh, are continuing to band together as Wolverines and keep each other safe. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks very much, Dana. And Dana will be able to stick around for a while, but you'll have to leave a bit before the hour to join the Michigan Medicine Town Hall. So she's very popular uh, these days. Uh, but look, I really want to reinforce the notion that we've created these opportunities for our students. And we know that faculty and staff are also, many are waiting for vaccination. Uh, the reason we've prioritized students, of course, is the semester's ending. Uh, they're about to head home all around the state and many of them all around the country. Uh, so we want to be sure that the emptying of our campus uh, doesn't uh, take disease with it. Uh, we've chosen the J&J &J vaccine, as Dana said, because it's a single dose, so we don't need to worry about when folks are leaving town. A shot in the arm, they take their shot, and then they're you know, going to leave town uh, on the pathway to being protected. Uh, there's also a recent information up on the CDC website that not only does the J&J &J vaccine, as well as the others, prevent serious illness and death, it also seems to diminish uh, infection and diminish transmission. Uh, so that makes it way less likely that our students would inadvertently carry uh, COVID uh, back to their family and others that may still be susceptible. So we've got a time window and we're really going to push hard on our student uh, community. Uh, regardless of prior infection, uh, whether you've had COVID-19 in the past or not, the vaccine helps. It increases your level of protection, makes it way less likely that you might be subject to COVID a second time or spread COVID without realizing it to others. Uh, so please, everybody get yourself signed up uh, and vaccinated um, uh, be before the fall term starts for sure. If you don't get it now, get it over the summer. Uh, vaccination eventually is going to mean that you're not going to have to take the weekly saliva uh, mandatory testing. Uh, we're not ready to make that transition yet, but we will be before the new semester. So that's important. And if we can get almost everybody vaccinated, we could have a semester that looks an awful lot like normal, uh, but it really requires communal activity. Um, so keep yourself healthy, uh, prevent spread to the people you care about in your final uh, days on campus for the semester and when you head home. Uh, we're going to continue to work with the partners uh, that Dana mentioned as well as others and we continue of course to work closely with the state uh, and we'll try our very best to set up special dedicated clinics of the type Dana described for our students. We'll try to set them up for our faculty and staff. Uh, but in the interim, we continue to encourage you to reach out and get vaccinated wherever you can get vaccinated. Uh, that's the most important thing, especially in light of what Dr. Milani said about how 
uh, COVID is really surging around the state uh, of Michigan. So it's really critically important as we try to get to the end game with way less illness and way less loss of life, of course. Uh, so let me turn things back over to Dr. Milani and Vice President for Student Life, Martino Harmon will join in to answer some questions. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll, we'll transition here. I just want to reiterate two points. Um, for folks who do have questions, I, my suggestion is if you have a doctor or other healthcare provider is really ask, ask the questions. Uh, the source matters and there is still misinformation about the vaccines out there. The other piece about the J&J &J vaccine, I, that's what I would recommend to my own, um, the, the young adults in my life that I love. Um, I'm not concerned about this number versus that number in actual real life. This is a great, great vaccine. And again, people's lives are complicated. I remember when I graduated, I moved five times in the next four months. And um, so I think being um, done has, huge advantage. So for the students, you know, make, make, uh, make an effort to get these because it, uh, it, it, it's going to, this is a good opportunity to get this taken care of. It's, it's going to just get a little more complicated in the coming weeks. So Martino. Yes. So Dr. Mulani, I, great, great, great to see you virtually again. Yeah. And uh, I just want to put in a plug for my excitement about the opportunity students have to get vaccinated. Our plans for the Michigan experience in the fall of 2021, especially around the more normal residential experience that we intend to provide, is dependent and partly in terms of the number of vaccinated students. So it's critically important, and I'm excited that these opportunities are opening up. You know, I would say to students, get vaccinated now and help contribute not just to your own safety, but also the safety of your fellow Wolverines, your family and friends but also help uh, bring back the sort of Michigan experience that we're all missing so much. You know, soon uh, many of our students will be traveling home and you can greatly reduce the chances of bringing the virus back with you when you travel uh, to your hometown this summer by getting vaccinated now before you head home. So it's really important. Uh, some of you may be staying around Ann Arbor for the spring and summer semesters. So again, getting vaccinated here will help you stay focused on your studies and allow you to just to enjoy your summer. I mean, when you think about it, the pandemic has taken so much away from us. The vaccine is a way to get some of those things back. So I would just say, don't miss your shot. Um, each one counts. Well said, well said. And, and I, I, again, like for folks who have access to Moderna, Pfizer, that's great too. You know, they're all, all the vaccines are, are equivalent in my mind, uh, but get the thing that is most convenient, most available to you. Speaking of uh, next fall, I'm going to be starting as a freshman at U of M this fall. Explanation point, exciting. <laughs> so uh, when will I be able to apply for housing? Well, to this student, we're excited that you're, you will be starting at U of M this fall. Information started to go out to new first-year students earlier this week on April 6th. And you can find out more details by going to the housing website at housing.umich.edu. But I'm gonna give you some key pointers right now. After the University of Michigan receives your enrollment deposit, you'll receive an email with a link to the Michigan housing application. And several students have received that. For returning students interested in living on campus, next year, we started accepting applications on March 26th, and they're due by April 30th for priority consideration, which doesn't guarantee a space, but I encourage students to apply by April 30th. But even if you miss that date, you can still submit your application and we'll assign as many individuals based on need as we can using the approved occupancy plan for the fall. In terms of when you'll know about your housing assignment, uh, the actual assignments will be made in the beginning of June. So housing placements, housing, housing placement offers begin June 1st and will run through early August, just as we do in normal years. And again, uh, putting in a plug to get vaccinated because it will really help us provide a more normal residential experience this fall. So make sure you get your shot. And you know what? Uh, don't stop at COVID. Make sure you've gotten all your shots. 
So uh, Hep A, meningitis B, especially, those are things that some students might have missed with routine vaccination. Mm -hmm. Uh, so speaking of fun on campus, my roommate and I got tickets to the basketball watch party at the big house and had so much fun. Is student life planning more to host more events like this? You know, I was there and it was great. Other than some pretty rough weather for a couple of games, but the students, hang, they, they hung in there. They had a great time and it was good to see. Unfortunately, we won't have any more watch parties at the big house this semester, but we're happy to, to have a variety of different events. Dr. Ernst even mentioned that a little bit. Uh, for example, um, our fun at the union with, get, with games of cornhole. Uh, Dr. Milani and I have a little cornhole challenge that we've got to get to at some point. Giant Jenga and, uh, was also a big hit. And the sip and strolls, which allow you just to take a safe walk with someone. All those activities are helping students to get out in fresh air, to make friendships with others, and just to chat with people. But coming up, we have more safe outside uh, events for students, like intramural sports games that happen several evenings each week, and even drop-in games of tennis, basketball, and even more at Palmer Field. I'm planning to be out at Palmer Field passing out water um, in the near future. We also know that students need fuel for your exams in the form of snacks. So we're going to give out a final survival snack pack distribution on April 22nd. Let me repeat that. Final snack pack uh, will be, snack packs will be distributed on April 22nd. So keep an eye on uh, at your inbox for our Sunday email called Top Picks, and that allows you to know what's happening during the week. Um, so don't miss out on those events, especially free food. Um, and uh, maybe I'll see you at a few of them. Yeah, I think uh, you had me at snack. So, uh, <laughs> so, and and I think Martino, uh, you and I have a, a date coming up, and I'm I'm gonna bring uh, Sully the puppy. He's not quite quite like Reggie, but but he he does love uh, love students. So I look forward to to seeing a lot of the students as well. So thank you for all the work that your team has been doing to to keep us safe. And I'm gonna bring uh, Provost Collins on next. Hi, Preeti. It's really wonderful to see you again this afternoon. Yeah, it's, it's great to see you. Uh, I, I, I'm sure you have a few updates for us, and then we'll, we'll talk about the fall. Yeah, that sounds great. So first of all, I wanted to add my voice to all who are strongly encouraging everyone to become vaccinated, to, to get their shot. Um, and there are a variety of ways to find out where the vaccination is available. But in particular, as we announced uh, in this session and as we're providing information about in a variety of ways, please, for all of our students, take advantage of the opportunities to get vaccinated uh, as soon as possible. And all of our students means our undergraduates and also, of course, our graduate and our professional students. Um, so I did, as you said, want to just um, highlight some of the very exciting things that have been happening on campus as we get towards the end of the semester. You know, um, it, it's just really a, a pleasure to have an opportunity to, to do that. First, I wanted to congratulate our debate team. Uh, for the fifth time in its history, the University of Michigan's debate team earned second place at the 75th Annual National Debate Tournament. That competition, of course, was held virtually at the end of March. 78 teams from 44 institutions participated, and actually Michigan was one of only four schools to have all three of, the debate, of their debate teams reach the elimination round. So congratulations to our debate team. I'd also like to highlight the annual Europe Spring Symposium, which is on April 22nd. And as many of you know, Europe is our undergraduate research opportunity program, uh, nationally recognized as a model program for engaging undergraduates in research opportunities. It was actually launched more than 30 years ago and has active participation from across all of our schools and colleges. So this year, not surprisingly, the pandemic altered a lot of the research projects and restricted things like physical lab access. And so while that context was really challenging, a number of our Europe mentors have uh, gotten extremely creative, many appreciating really the opportunity to rethink how to approach research and find new ways to engage student researchers. 
So Europe expanded and broadened its reach to community organizations and uh, research projects included addressing social and environmental justice, food insecurity, human rights, public health, and, and much, much more. Europe alumni and former Michigan faculty were able to participate. People from different parts of the world and mentors could work remotely from other institutions as well as industry and community organizations. And so we were able to have more students actually participate, even many who were not on campus. So this year's virtual event provides really a unique window into the diverse research and scholarship and creative activities that represent all of the areas of research across the 19 schools and colleges. So again, just a shout out for the symposium, which will be on April 22nd with Zoom breakout rooms and featuring more than a thousand of our undergraduate students showcasing their work, including a number of projects related to COVID. So I wanted to congratulate those students as well and say that uh, we look forward to uh, seeing the, the great work that they've been able to accomplish. Yeah, that's great news. Actually, Europe started, I, I was an undergraduate when it started, so just a little over 30 years ago, and boy, it's grown so much, and I know it's such a valuable experience for, for so many of our students. Uh, so people are thinking about the fall, and what are the schools and colleges thinking about in terms of course modalities? Yeah, so, so we know that many of you are uh, having questions about course modalities for the fall semester. And as we've discussed in prior briefings, the decisions about course modalities are being made at the unit level. Most of the moderate sized and smaller classes and seminars, as well as discussion sections for large classes will engage in person. And again, most large lectures will be remaining remote and will continue to accommodate needs as we can for example, for international students by providing some remote and hybrid options. The schools and colleges are leading the decisions about course modalities, focusing on pedagogical and programmatic needs. So in, in thinking about today's discussion, I spoke with LSA Dean Ann Kurzan, and she shared some of her thoughts about this uh, question that we know is uh, widespread out there and really important. Um, so while every school is taking a slightly different approach that is consistent with its own context and its own um, programmatic needs, we felt that sharing some of the information about LSA's perspective would be useful. So LSA instructors, like LSA students, largely report being really excited to return to in-person teaching and learning, assuming, of course, that things continue to go well in terms of our public health conditions for the fall and in terms of vaccinations, as we've been discussing. They're also eager to continue learning from all of the pedagogical innovations that happened as part of remote instruction over the past year. So most of LSA's courses are currently scheduled to include in-person learning. Classes of 150 and more are doing their lectures remotely, with some instructors finding very creative ways to provide opportunities for their students to meet in person. And as I mentioned, discussion sections will be available in person. Some instructors are experimenting with blended classes. While mostly in person, these would incorporate some remote pedagogical practices and ways of meeting together or working together that have worked really well over the past year. LSA will also continue to offer some online and remote office hours, which we really learned helps to improve access for students. And so uh, that's a feature that I suspect all of our schools and colleges will uh, continue with as well. And LSNA is prepared to work with those students who cannot get to campus this fall so that they can continue to make progress towards their degrees. So Again, we're really eager to return to in-person learning and teaching, which is one of the key reasons that we keep encouraging uh, vaccination, of course, but, and also to, to really returning to the sense of community, those serendipitous encounters and just the energy that comes from being together in person. And we also are excited to continue the experimentation about what's possible using technology to improve access and inclusion and to enhance and expand the ways that we teach and learn across our campus. So uh, there's a lot that's going on related to our academics for uh, I'm planning for the fall. This is great news. I, I, I don't think any of us ever thought we would long to be in a classroom as much as, as we do, but I know our students and our faculty and staff are 
they, they can't wait to be back Absolutely. To, to in-person learning. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to President Schlissel to help us launch the Q&A. Yep, so thanks uh, very much, uh, Provost Collins and Vice President Harmon. Uh, and yeah, I wanna also make it a personal thank you as well. You know, the team has been working exceptionally hard as has all the faculty and staff and our students as well. But I wanna say a special thank you uh, to these executive officers who, uh, who are both feed in uh, basically 24 seven. So thanks very much. Uh, so we're gonna transition now to the uh, question and answer section. And I know uh, Preeti, you have a question for Dana before she has to drop off and head to the medicine town hall. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So Dana, um, I, this is about Blue Q, which I, I know you get lots of questions about. And one of the questions is, should we update our Blue Q if we got our shot elsewhere or just wait until we are asked and decline it? The invitation that is. Thank you, yes, um, fantastic question. We would love for you to update Blue Q. <laughs> it helps us know if you've been vaccinated somewhere else so we don't continue to invite you and we can move those invitations on to other students. So really appreciate that. There's a early in your questionnaire, a radio button that you can just click to say, no longer interested, I've been able to get my vaccine somewhere else. Um, on that same thread, you can actually change your mind in the other order. So if you've previously completed your questionnaire and said you did not want to get vaccinated, a little time has passed, we've seen how others have responded to the vaccine, you're welcome to go in anytime and update and change your mind. So please do that. I think on the um, point of scheduling appointments, so you can register in multiple settings, if you schedule an appointment, please only schedule one. You know, back to my point earlier about not having enough vaccine for everybody, we really would appreciate it if you just schedule a single appointment. And um, it, it could be through your blue queue or if you get into the Meyer registry or the Kroger registry through them as well, but appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dana. And, and again, for people like just what's happening next week is the beginning. So if, if you don't end up getting an invitation. Um, don't despair. You know, keep keep uh, keep paying attention. I think we'll. I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do more in the following weeks. Good. Uh, so, question one: If you still have to wear a mask and be wary of infection, what is the point of getting the vaccine? That is a great question for Dr. Ernst. Yeah. First, let me say I'm not sure I've been able to uh, add my. Uh, excitement for the expanded eligibility for the vaccine and uh, thank you know everybody um, including the president and those on this call for really trying to find opportunities for students to connect to the vaccine I think that it's uh, it's our way out of this um, to answer the specific question you know masking is really effective in reducing transmission rates and I think that uh, that they've allowed us to to do some of the things that we need to do that are essential, you know, um, but you can't always mask and particularly around, you know, when eating or in times when people want to be together, you know, to reduce that risk, vaccines really do, as you suggest time and time again, Preeti, protect yourself, but protect others. So, you know, I, I think there's a strong argument for this as a common good for the community as well as for the individual. Yep, great. And, you know, just again, I think as there, there are certain things you can do if you're fully vaccinated in your sort of personal space, not out in public yet, but, uh, but we'll get there. So I, I have heard about some resistance and hesitancy among younger adults. I will say that you probably have the most to gain in a lot of ways in terms of particularly our students getting back to something uh, that feels closer to normal. So thanks, Rob. Uh, next question, questions on inflation. Inflation is rising significantly. Will our salaries keep up? Given that faculty and staff have endured a difficult work period, but still performed their duties, taught and produced research from university service under difficult circumstances, would help faculty and staff morale to get a decent raise. And uh, we're, we're fortunate, actually, we have a, a, a quite a re renowned economist on, on, this, uh, on this town hall. Uh, so if Provost Collins, her day job before dealing with COVID uh, was really, uh, as, a, as an internationally renowned economist. So I'm gonna give her this question. Thanks, thanks Rudy. And I see it as a question both about um, inflation and related to budget. So we do plan to have a modest merit program this fall. That's really important. And so that's, I think the place to start. 
However, the specific amount of what merit program we will be able to offer hasn't been determined yet. It'll actually um, follow approval of the university's budget in June by the Board of Regents. Um, so as is our practice, we regularly do benchmark our merit programs with actual and projected inflation measures as, long, as well as various additional metrics such as peer data. So in terms of inflation, I'll just note briefly that yes, there's considerable discussion about what inflation will look like in the coming months and uh, years. And it is true that supply bottlenecks and strong demand for a variety of reasons as we come <clears throat> out of the pandemic are likely to push prices up. Um, so that is certainly true. At the same time, there, that's short term. And there are a number of underlying factors that have contributed to low inflation over the past decade. And those are actually likely to continue exerting downward pressure as well. And so on balance, the Fed, and of course, there are lots of different forecasts out there, but the Fed forecasts the headline or total inflation as rising to perhaps 2.4% this year, and then settling down to maybe just over 2% for 2023 going forward. And, and a number of forecasts are, are in that range. So I also just wanted to say, we know how truly difficult the salary freeze has been over this last year. I'm really very grateful for the extraordinary and collective efforts that have been taken across campus to balance the budget through what's been really a difficult time. And, and the salary freeze has clearly been a, a particularly challenging aspect of that. So we will share out our plans for a merit program as soon as we have more details and are able to do so. Great. And uh, we have a few more questions here. What guidance or support can we expect from UHR as schools and colleges begin recruiting to fill open positions again? And as it relates to in-person visits and interviews, and again, uh, I'll ask uh, Provost Collins to comment. Sure. Um, sure. Happy to do so. So at the moment, the university's restrictions on travel and hosting expenses do remain in place. Um, we'll continue revisiting those restrictions. And it's certainly my hope that we'll be able to announce further relaxation of the restrictions in the coming months. Many units have been really successful and able to hire for critical positions during the hiring freeze. And it's been exciting to see how thoughtful uh, and creative they have been to use technology so as to ensure that there is really a very high quality and inclusive hiring process. If there are in extraordinary cases, if there is a critical need for a campus visit in order to complete a key hire. There is a process to request an exception, but of course in those cases, um, the candidate and anyone participating would certainly need to adhere to all of the campus safety guidelines. So again, we'll be revisiting uh, and reviewing the restrictions that are still in place and certainly sharing information out if there are any changes. Great, thank you. And Another question that I'm gonna uh, give to you, in what ways is the university including graduate students in the planning for the fall semester? Yeah, and this is a, this is a really important, uh, important question. So as I shared when we rolled out our fall plan a couple of weeks ago, um, engaging with our faculty, students and staff, but in particular our students is in the fall planning process is really critically important. So. Our schools and colleges are engaging with graduate students in a variety of different contexts, and that's both in their roles as students and also very importantly in their roles as instructors. So for example, uh, the Rackham Graduate School has taken a number of steps to engage graduate students, such as holding joint graduate student town halls with LSA and the School of Music, Theater and Dance, the Rackham Student Government, has hosted town halls, including lunches with deans to engage. Um, the individual schools and colleges are doing outreach and engaging graduate students in their planning work in a variety of different ways. Academic Human Resources is in frequent communication with the leadership of GEO on issues that relate to fall planning. And we're gonna continue including graduate students as the planning for the next year progresses, and that'll be both at the unit level and uh, in the other types of venues that I've mentioned. Great. 
Uh, Martino, do you do you have anything to add to that? I mean, obviously, graduate students are not just in the academic settings, but also in uh, many aspects of, of student life. Absolutely. I'll add two things. One, in the fall, in October, and in a, in a follow-up in December, uh, Student Life worked with Academic Affairs to launch two important surveys. And those surveys provided uh, an enormous amount of feedback not just for winter term, but also for fall and, and other topics around support. And we, we had uh, over 9,000 students that completed the survey and 36% of those students were graduate students. So that information was very valuable and important in terms of, of future planning. In addition, within student life, uh, we have a number of advisory boards and those advisory boards are often asked questions about the fall and safety measures and other things we can do to enhance the student experience. I know my own uh, vice president advisory board, they provided incredible uh, feedback in terms of how we can plan for fall and how can we engage second year students and how can we keep their campus safe. So those are just two examples that I wanted to mention. Great, thank you. Uh, the first live question is, is uh, for President Schlissel. I, I see in the news that Michigan Medicine is canceling elective surgeries. Can you clarify what's going on? Sure. Like uh, most all health systems around the state, because of the explosion in number of cases of COVID, uh, but also because of regular volumes of patients. You know, we care for hundreds of thousands of people regularly and, you know, more than a million people in referrals for various things. Uh, the hospital is running at extremely high occupancy. Uh, to keep people safe and to save room for the uh, inevitable emergencies that occur uh, at all times of the year. Uh, small numbers of surgeries have been postponed this week and small numbers of elective surgeries are postponed for next week. And we continue to carefully monitor occupancy of the hospital, occupancy of our intensive care beds. Uh, just by way of level setting, I think yesterday there were around 85 uh, COVID patients in uh, you know, our university hospital here. At the peak of the pandemic, early in the pandemic last spring, we were approaching 250 patients in the hospital. So, you know, we're not near those levels yet where there'll be profound effects on other kinds of care, uh, but we have to monitor things closely. You know, we've learned a lot more about how to take care of COVID patients, how to take care of them as outpatients and how to efficiently treat them when they do have to be hospitalized. Uh, but now things are getting tighter, and uh, that's yet another reason why, as uh, you said in the beginning, Preeti, everybody has to double down until we're, uh, our community is fully vaccinated. Uh, we really have to take extra care. And I also think we have to take account of the fact uh, that um, perhaps as many as half of the cases, if not more, are due to the variant virus. And that virus uh, transmits more easily. So one infected person is more likely to have a larger cluster of uh, contacts that become infected, also putting pressure on our hospital. But right now, Michigan Medicine's keeping up small numbers of postponed surgeries, regular care is occurring. I actually had a, an appointment of my own at West Ann Arbor this morning. It was normal in and out. Uh, so, um, you yeah, know, that's where we are and we have to keep close monitor on things. Yeah, thank you. And, and again, for people who might not realize it, we're like always at capacity. Like it's just, this is, there aren't empty beds. And so when additional pressure comes on, we, it isn't a switch, you know, you have to get to plan, but like where we have to be hopeful here too. Uh, someone asked about how to update the blue Q questionnaire and you just go in and retake the questionnaire and your second response or whatever, the most recent response will, um, will be the one that counts. Uh, question for Martino, will intramural and club sports be offered in the fall? Uh, yes, we absolutely are planning and to, to have intramural club sports that will be more like a normal experience in the fall. And this presumes that we have high rates of vaccination and that we can uh, relax some of the, the public health measures and also policies around the state um, as well. So it's our, it certainly is our goal uh, to return uh, to a more normal intramural club sport experience as part of fall. Uh, Martina, one, one other question uh, for you. What kind of mental health resources are available for students? I know we've reviewed this, but it's worth, especially as the semester is getting stressful for some, if you could just yes. touch on that. So th this is an incredibly important. It was important before the pandemic and the pandemic has only heightened the importance of 
the need for mental health resources. So all of our, our standard resources are there and available, whether it's Wolverine Wellness, CAPS, uh, Recreation Sports. But one of the things that we're doing as we look more toward the future is taking a, a different, more holistic approach. And I've worked with Provost Collins to convene a collaborative committee of very talented people from academic affairs and student life. And that group is called the Student Mental Health Innovation uh, Approaches Committee. And that committee is really looking across the board. What can we do better? How can we provide more access? How can we address some of the root causes that cause stress in the first place? Um, how can we use technology better? And they've been at, um, they've developed a number of initial approaches and they've been shopping those around and getting feedback from various uh, stakeholders across campus. And that, that committee is co-chaired by um, Associate Provost Amy Dittmar and Dean of Students Laura Blake-Jones, and they intend to have recommendations uh, for Provost Collins and I in uh, May. And so we're, we're looking at really expanding the way we look at how we address and support mental health needs. Yeah, I, I think that that is also one of the potential silver linings, the number of people that work so closely right now that normally didn't work as closely. Uh, the coordination piece, I, I hope we can really put some of this energy after, after we're not talking about COVID all the time is really talk about well-being more broadly. And I know a lot of students, both the ones coming in and the ones that are coming back, um, have a lot of, of, of loss and grief to process. Uh, I, I wanted to, I know there's a question about commencement. I'm gonna turn it to the president to, to comment on that. Uh, you know, we're getting questions that in, in light of uh, Michigan status leading the nation in the rate of COVID-19, which is just awful, uh, are we reconsidering our plans to open the big house to allow students uh, to um, enjoy the virtual graduation with their classmates? Uh, as of now, we haven't changed our plans, but obviously we're following things uh, very closely. Uh, for the big house uh, for graduation, all the students that come in are going to be masked. They will be required to have had a COVID-19 test within the preceding days. They'll be seated in small clusters around our massive stadium. Uh, and we think we can do that safely. It's an outdoor venue, of course. Uh, so we remain hopeful. Uh, the other reason I remain hopeful that we can do it is our surveillance testing of, uh, for COVID-19 um, uh, shows uh, percent positivity of around 1% or even slightly less, even though statewide, those numbers are much, much higher in terms of COVID testing. So, you know, I think our students by and large are doing a very good job trying to remain safe. Uh, they'll be tested beforehand, they'll wear masks, they'll sit in assigned seats in small groups, they'll be outdoors, and we think that's probably going to end up being safer for more people than what students might otherwise do in terms of getting together, perhaps indoors in confined spaces, uh, where it might be more dangerous. So as of now, it's uh, still a go. Thank you. Uh, there's a question also for you, President. Um, when and where will the replay of this, you know, this a particular town hall be shared uh, for parents to watch? Yep, you know, we post uh, the link uh, usually late in the afternoon of the day uh, of the event. And I'm seeing here, um, it also gets pushed out in the Family Matters newsletter. We send a link that, that goes out to uh, all parents. Uh, I put out my weekly email this afternoon to all members of the Michigan community. Uh, that will also have the link uh, to the video. Uh, so there are multiple places to find it. Great. I know we're, we're getting close to the end. I, I'm going to turn it to you to close us out. Yeah, you know, I'll you know, take one more question that came up a couple of times in the Q&A, and I apologize for not being able to get to all of these or more of these. It's about getting back to work. I know there are many, many staff uh, that watch uh, these broadcasts uh, every uh, other week that we come on. So I, you know, I want to be sensitive to you know, their interests and needs as well. You know, as of now, the staff across the campus, as opposed to the health system, uh, we'll continue to work remotely through that date in late June that we've already told everybody, uh, but there'll be a gradual return to in-person work in the months across the summer and then heading into the academic year, which we're hoping uh, with high levels of vaccination can be a much more normal academic year. Uh, that, that said, what we're working on in all of our units, both the academic units and other units, um, is to take advantage of what we've learned about remote work 
and find ways to offer our staff the opportunity to spend part of their work week uh, working remotely if they'd like to do that. I think it works out well, cuts down on commuting time, improves our carbon footprint. I think a lot of people think they have a much better work-life balance when they can work a couple of days a week from home. And we've learned that that works very well for the university. So we're gonna try to capture some of that, uh, but we'll continue fully remote you know, through the end of the spring here. We'll gradually transition back to increasing amounts of in-person work across the summer months. And then we'll try to get to a new steady state uh, in the fall semester. Uh, but you know, we're just about done with our time. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank our speakers and thank everybody that watches these each week. Um, I think the sentiment to carry away uh, is we are very close to turning a corner, uh, but there's a last hill that we need to climb. And uh, the question about occupancy in the hospital around the state, that's a little bit scary. Um, uh, the uh, doubling or tripling in the number of cases in recent uh, weeks uh, around our state is very concerning. Uh, it's uh, younger people. So those of us that thought, you know, not us, don't worry, uh, you have to worry. This can uh, easily infect people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and make them quite ill. Uh, so this is sort of the big push. Uh, uh, try your very best to get vaccinated. We'll try to help, but we're limited by the amount of vaccine we get from the state. Uh, so please keep trying your very best to be vaccinated. Hang in there with the masking and distancing and small group socializing. Outdoors always better uh, than indoors. And I really truly look forward uh, to um, a much better uh, summer and then a fall semester as we transition back uh, to normalcy. So thanks very much for all the hard work. Uh, please hang in there. Uh, have a great spring weekend and go blue.